am going to get us kicked off. Um, my name is Emily Lamb. I work with the Ashoka U team. Um, and we are so thrilled to have all of you here today, uh, regardless of what time it is. We have uh, uh, colleagues in Australia who are speaking today where it's very early in the morning um, to folks on the west coast of the US where it's in the afternoon. And so thank you for spending the next hour with us today. Now, this session is part of a three part series during the exchange called the Working Across Differences track. These sessions have been put together to shine a light on a crucial conversation for today's change makers. And that's about toxic polarization and the approaches, ideas, and the community of educators who are fostering healthy, safe, and connected communities in these trying times. Now, these sessions have been made possible by the Fetzer Institute. Thank you, Fetzer. Uh, with the mission to help build the spiritual foundation for a living world, the Fetzer Institute supports work in a variety of areas, including uh, the health of our democracy, the landscape of spirituality and society, and education. If you want to learn more about Fetzer, you can find them online at www.fetzer.org. And now I'll stop talking and hand it over uh, to the folks you came to hear from. A special day, thanks to our speakers today for all of your work and for sharing your insights with us. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce our facilitator, Eddie Gonzalez, Associate Director of the Civil Conversations Project at On Being. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Emily. And uh, a big thank you to Ashoka Yu. Um, a thank you to our panelists that are here with us today. Uh, Rachel Cunliffe will not be on video because it's messing with her broadband, but if you're one of the panelists, if you want to say, hello or wave, that way folks can get a sense of who you are by face. And a big thank you to every single one of you for attending today. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Fetzer Institute as well, thank you for the support of this Working Across Differences track. So my name is Eddie Gonzalez and I am from the On Being Project working in social healing and civil conversations. I use he, him, his. And as a beginning of, uh, of our time together, I want to acknowledge that land is such a part of who we are, um, and as our personal stories are woven into a historical moment built upon a past and moving towards a future, um, so does land also have a story. And j just as we have individual ancestors as well, so does the land. And in this moment, I just want to honor the first peoples of the land um, that I am currently on here in Queens, New York City, um, traditionally the land of the Lenape and Canarsie people. Um, the history of so much of our land also is, is one of forced removal and of ethnic cleansing. So just, um, you know, inviting you to consider what histories have brought you to the land that you're currently on and what histories have made that land available to you. So um, I also want to acknowledge that we are in a very interesting moment, zooming in from different parts of the world <laughs> in a very interesting and uncertain time. Um, so just welcoming that into the space, however it finds us and however it has us also imagining this work going forward. Today we're gonna hear from panelists who have spent several months over the past few years learning, testing, and creating programming that has been designed to center bridge building across difference. And we're gonna hear their stories, their findings, what they believe uh, should be shared in these times of deep division. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do is maybe a little unconventional. Sometimes we break into small groups uh, kind of towards the end of events like this, and I want us to do it at the beginning. So um, I'm going to break us into groups of three um, and ask that uh, during your time together, you um, sort of ask each other where you're calling from, uh, you know, what's bringing you here? What about this panel feels relevant to you? And perhaps some questions that you already know you're bringing with you. Um, to the panelists and uh, and when we come back, hopefully we can share those in the chat uh, and, uh, and it'll be a way for you know our panelists also to to answer with those questions in mind um, as we move into our our time together. So um, I think Emily Emily is managing our small group moment and I'll chat you the questions um, here in the chat box. So see you back here in a bit. Well, I'm, I'm going to call us back. It was a pleasure to uh, to be in my small group and hear uh, what folks are thinking about, what folks are asking, and uh, I encourage I encourage you all if if you're coming away with any that you'd like to share with the larger group to put in the chat box now. Um, maybe just uh, a word or two of of what questions you might be holding. 
Um, in the meantime, I'm going to welcome our, our international panelists. So uh, with us, we have uh, Ada Gregory, um, who's at the Institute for Ethics, uh, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University. Um, she's been working on a uh, campus-wide deliberative dialogue trainings for first-year students starting um, with, with an orientation. So I'm excited to introduce you to her. Ashley Clark, who uh, is a program manager of social innovation at CQ University, along with Leslie Lowe, who's a student there at CQ University. They've been working together on a training um, uh, that's incorporating indigenous ways of knowing into the ways that we approach uh, contemporary questions and, and issues. And then Rachel Cunliffe, Assistant Professor of Conflict Resolution at Portland State University. Um, she's been working on a project about fostering institutional call-in cultures rather than call-out cultures. And um, I'm excited to have them introduce their work. So that you know um, sort of the flow that we have for the next 40 minutes together, um, I'm imagining uh, something along the lines that we, I've been thinking about hope as, it, as it's a, a muscle, something that we do intentionally and practice. Um, and I've heard somebody uh, break that practice into three sort of uh, concepts. The first one being taking a clear view of reality, looking at what problem might be there in, in the language of change making as I've heard it used today, in this case, toxic polarization. Um, then what we hope for, uh, you know, universities as a place to curb that, and then how we take steps in the direction of our hope is a third part. Um, and so my hope is to really draw out some of these um, topics as we, as we discuss. First, looking at what our plans were, then looking at how they were um, sort of iterated and then lessons learned along the way. And I have a few sort of more individual questions too, but does that sound good for the next 40 minutes? And then we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. That sounds great. Well, let me, um, let me go ahead and begin with, um, with Rachel. And uh, we'll take five minutes each. Rachel, if you don't mind introducing yourself and maybe diving into uh, you know, a little bit of the what and why of the project from a high level, um, the blueprint that you began with, maybe problems that you saw needing addressing, people involved, structure, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much, Eddie. Um, I like Oregon. Um, and the university where I work, Portland State University, is primarily a commuter university. We have about 30,000 students, about 3,000 of whom are resident on campus. Everybody else commutes. So we're a non-traditional um, student body for the most part with a number of supporting offices um, in the administration. Um, the team came together. Uh, we're all related with respect to conflict resolution. Two of the team members are former grad students in our program and two of us are faculty members in the program um, and both of the former graduate students have jobs now on campus in administration and the project really came from them and the faculty the two of us who are faculty members were invited in um, to assist as they identified an issue with call out culture in within the sort of administrative offices um, on campus and so the focus of our study really has been on um, what happens in administration primarily and then and then what the impact is of that on students so as faculty members we had pretty steep learning curve in terms of the cultures of the workplaces of administration um, what we decided to do initially was to um, to bring together people who were in in these administrative offices to find out more about what they felt sort of the need for change was and so we conducted a needs assessment and um, i can talk more about that um, as time goes by but we included our in our in our invitations to those um, semi-structured interviews um, people all across administration from student life to the provost's office to human resources to um, the uh, to include also resource centers such as our veterans resource center disabilities resource center women's resource center um, student life the um, offices which are meant to deal with um, anti-oppression um, incidents um, so some of the co conduct offices offices that deal with conduct issues on campus 
Um, we also invited our campus security force, which is actually um, a sworn police force of its own. They were the only group that actually refused the invitation. Um, but otherwise, we we had we conducted a number of interviews, about 20 interviews, which it, some of which included whole groups of people and others of which were just individuals from their offices. Um, and the purpose of the needs assessment was to find out what people felt needed to happen and then to plan an intervention around those uh, um, stated needs, which we would. Have I said enough, Eddie? That's a great introduction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley and Leslie, I wonder if you'd like to share about your project. Do you want me to kick off, Ash? Yeah. So, good day. My name's Leslie Lowe. Um, I'm a student at Central Queensland University in Australia. Um, I've got a Bachelor of Environmental Science degree, currently working on a Bachelor of um, Aviation. I was introduced to um, social innovation. Oh, sorry, before I go into that, I'd also like to do an acknowledgement to country on behalf of Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we uh, live and work on, um, the elders past and present, and our emerging elders on country. Uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, with that, um, we started off um, with working across differences. Um, we applied for the uh, scholarship and we looked at that um, as part of looking at social innovation through the Indigenous lens. Um, and with that, um, we designed our project around that. And part of that is a whole part of the Indigenous storytelling. I probably want to start off with that. So part of the um, workshops were delivering storytelling um, from an Indigenous perspective. And one of those is the stories of the Seven Sisters. And I don't know if you can see behind me up on the wall there, there's a beautiful painting. Um, but it's one of these really lovely Indigenous stories that encapsulates our whole education system um, our ways of being and knowing um, and our knowledge systems and how we pass that on. And the story of the Seven Sisters um, correlates with a constellation called the Pallades system. Um, and with that system, with that constellation, every year at a certain time, it sits in the, in the stars. Um, but it also sits so low on, low on the horizon in Australia and the Northern Hemisphere that it looks like it's touching the ground. And with this has originated this story that's tens of thousands of years old. Um, and that relates back to our social structures, how we treat our women, how we treat our children, um, and these ways of passing down this knowledge. And this story goes along the pathways that when this star system touches the ground, or it looks like it's touching the ground, the seven stars turn into women, these beautiful women, these ice maidens, and they come to earth. Um, and they travel around the land and they taste all the fruits and, and they look after the land. But um, there was seven young men and they fell in love with these women. And uh, they left their country, left their homes, and they kept following them all over the land. And they kept presenting them with beautiful gifts of honey and different fruits, um, different berries and all those great things that we um, have from the land in Australia. Um, but these girls were ice maidens and they weren't really interested in uh, the people of the earth and they travelled around the land. And as these men kept travelling further and further away from the land and they fell deeply in love with these women. And eventually as this constellation, um, the changing the patterns through the, um, the year, uh, leaves the ground at this time the women leave the ground too and they go back up in the sky and these young men were heartbroken they were hundreds of kilometers away from their homeland and uh, they ended up pining away and dying and the ancestors on seeing this felt very sad so they thought they'd uh, reincarnate them as Orion's belt so Orion's belt sits alongside the Pallades system and now the young men watch over the seven maidens every year and that's the story but that also lends to um, the stories about how we um, respect and treat our women, how we look at the seasons, how that all correlates into our social structures and systems. So I might throw it to Ashley now. Do you want to just quickly tell everyone where you got that image and where it came from, Leslie? That image, so um, that was our second workshop. So we'd finished in Brisbane. Um, that was a great workshop. They were totally, two totally different workshops. But I think Ash is going to touch a bit on that. Um, our second one was in Townsville. Um, and as we were flying out of the airport in Brisbane, I saw this big cumulative nimbus cloud coming across and I went, oh, it looks like the head of an ale was sticking out of that cloud. By the time Ash got back and I pointed out it was gone, but anyhow, we did our workshop in Townsville. It was very successful, very emotive workshop. Um, and after that, 
Ash and I, as we do, um, we went for a debrief and dinner afterwards. And I was waiting for Ash to come up the street. And um, I seen a brother walking down the street. And um, it looked like he was trying to sell some wares. So I give him the nod and he'd come back up and see me. And he had this beautiful painting with him. He opened it up and he said, oh, I'm from uh, the Western Arnhem Land areas. And he said, um, I'm trying to get home. I need money. So I painted this picture, but no one to buy it off me. And I looked at it and it was exactly what we'd been talking about. We'd been talking about our astronomy, the storytelling, how we relate that in not only picture form, but in the storytelling and in our song lines um, and, and learning from this. So, but it was just one of these things. Um, Indigenous Australians um, aren't very, I suppose, safe socioeconomically. Um, he was on the streets trying to make his way back home. And I bought that beautiful painting, but it was just, I will say, there's no such thing as coincidence, there's always connections. Um, and it was a beautiful, really beautiful way to end the workshop, have a memento and be able to tell that story. And it just touched all the bases with what we were doing and, and trying to put across. Yeah. Um, and just introducing myself. So my name is Ashley Clark. I'm one of the program managers at Seek University and have been absolutely honoured to work with Leslie on this project. And the reason we wanted to um, start with a story is because that was such a big part of our workshop. Storytelling, acknowledgement of different ways of knowing, being, um, yeah, and different kind of social structures um, and really celebrating Indigenous people as socially innovative and respecting the ways that that was done um, was really a huge part of our workshop. So in summary, um, you know, the grant that we received really funded us to run a series of workshops across the country um, for our workshops for academics, community members, students, really whoever wanted to come um, to back and we made a really conscious decision to only focus on um, things pre-invasion and pre-colonisation as a way to celebrate and respect 65,000 years of knowledge. Um, so we can tell you more about how we did that a little bit later. Um, my role at the university is about designing and developing lots of different um, experiences for our student cohort and sometimes our staff cohort as well and I was lucky to meet Leslie three years ago in one of the programs that I ran um, and yeah, I'm just really, really, I suppose, passionate about supporting our students and empowering our students to tell their story and um, yeah, engage in social change in whatever way that, you know, is relevant or meaningful to them. Sorry, Eddie, we did it a bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Leslie and Ashley. Um, Ada. Sure. So I'm going to probably share a screen if that's okay. There's not a whole lot of slides, um, but I'm going to do that. So uh, just for context, um, and I'm going to see if I can do this. This is the first time I've tried to share my screen. So we'll, it'll be an experiment. Um, um, so I will make it large. So I want to provide a little context for um, how our project started. So we are a Southeastern University um, some 8,000 undergraduate students, another 4,000 or so of graduate students um, in a small southern town. And uh, at the time, uh, just before we applied for this grant, was when there was a lot of controversy around Confederate monuments, um, which hit very close to home. Uh, there is a Confederate monument downtown in Durham, and there's another one in Chapel Hill, and there were varying responses in those two towns, which are really interesting. In Durham, there were a group of protesters who uh, toppled the statue. Um, in uh, Chapel Hill, there was a group of protesters that were protecting the statue for a long, long time, and they actually ended up having police protect the statue, and it cost a lot of money um, on the state side to protect the statue, which caused a lot of hurt and pain, and then that resulted in a whole series of racial incidents, racial epithets, both in the community, but also on the campus. And the um, slide that I have up there is actually uh, one of the, the, the incidents that happened on campus at the Mary Lou Williams Center, which is the Student Center for Black Culture. Um, and really there began this long debate on campus um, about the, the university's response to those kinds of incidents. There was a noose that was hung in a tree outside of the student center. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the lynching history in, in the South, that is a, is a really racially charged um, sort of symbol. Um, in addition to that, uh, there began to be a series of town halls to try and, and talk about the issue. And what came from that really was that students were in a great deal of pain. 
Um, and the way in which they often responded to that was that the university needed to make new rules, new policies, and punish people um, for these kinds of acts. And that created great debates around what about free speech? Um, how can we do those things? And so in that context, we began to think about how can we as the Keenan Institute um, work across campus to begin to do something different. And that's where we began the Duke Project Citizen and Ashoka funded a big part of that. Um, the list that you see on the side is actually um, a list of rules that one of our faculty members, John Rose, who's a philosopher, came up with and on a class on polarization. So he had 18 students for a semester and all they discussed was uh, how do you talk across difference in this polarized society? How do you move forward? And to have those conversations, instead of say making rules or kicking people out of the class or all the doing those kinds of things, they said, we have to agree how we're gonna treat each other. We have to agree on how we're gonna talk about these things. And this is a, a, a list of some of the examples which we go into much more detail. But the reason I say this is this became the premise for how do we actually spread this work? Um, and I'll give you an example of, of one of the rules. So small stuff first. Um, what that really means is that you have to talk about your family, you have to talk about your dog, you have to talk about the things you like, you know, you have to talk about like, oh, we both like tacos, great. Um, we have to find some sort of common ground that we begin to see each other as humans. And so they spend time in the classroom sort of developing that. And we began to use those rules as a basis for thinking about, not really rules, but guidelines for thinking about how can we create these norms as early as possible on campus. So that students began to see this, as, this is the way we talk about hard things on campus. This is how we build community and this is how we begin to learn together. And that's where the idea for our citizen suppers began. And we were trying to figure out how to do that with 2000 for, uh, st uh, students or so. Um, and so what we decided is that we really wanted to create an atmosphere that felt different, that felt special from the minute you got here. And in a true Southern tradition, we decided to have a giant picnic with 2000 students. Um, we trained what they call are their first year um, advisory counselors. They're all assigned about three students, um, six students that are all first years and they guide them through their first weeks and months on campus. And we used some of those guidelines as well as some other tools that, that we had to help them think about how to have their fat chats, which are fun of the first conversations that they have on campus, welcoming the students, trying to create some community, and then begin to talk about some harder things. Um, the conversation that we focused on was on the summer reading, um, which was Tommy Orange's There, There, which is about a group of Native Americans in Oakland, California, that's written by a Cheyenne Arapaho author, um, Tommy Orange. And that is full of really difficult uh, issues from alcoholism and violence and a history of violence and uh, discrimination. And how do you manage to have that conversation with freshmen from all over the world who have all kinds of different experiences? Um, and I'm not gonna get into what we learned because I think that's the next question, um, but that's how we launched our project. And then the plan was to have a series of citizen suppers that began to engage these first year students more deeply into the community on harder issues that were of relevance to the Durham community. And I'll leave it there. Well, as we return back, I, I wonder if I can um, sort of have each of you speak for a, a brief moment about um, you know, how you implemented the, the project. And, and especially, you know, we have visions for the ways that things will be and then things change. And we have to sort of, you know, have that dance um, of, of what is and, and how things are actually happening. So I wonder if you all can talk a bit about how that, uh, how you began to roll these projects out and, and maybe moments of transition or pivot. Um, let's see, I guess, uh, Ada. Why don't we just jump back and, and why don't you uh, jump back in? Okay, say that question again. I was just trying to figure out my screen. <laughs> Which are we talking about sort of what we learned? Yeah, kind of what you learned, especially as you know, you tried to put this into practice. Yeah, so our initial, the, the, the picnic itself went off incredibly well. Um, and that week of orientation in which the students were utilizing those skills. But what we learned 
is that a lot of them did not necessarily feel comfortable launching then into more difficult conversations. Like we had created um, a sort of nice evolution of fairly easy conversations. So the first conversation was more community building. The second conversation was about life at Duke and what they might struggle with, but that seemed very comfortable. And then the third one, when we were talking about Tommy Orange, it seemed still pretty safe because it was this shared text that they could all talk about. But when we began to move to thinking about how do you work with the community on real events that affect their lives in deep ways, the students may or may not um, completely understand or relate to. And given that there's a long history of town gown relationships, um, we decided that we actually needed to drop back in the fall semester and utilize some more time and space to train students and how to do that to give them more opportunity to practice these skills. Um, because it, it wasn't something that you could do, you know, one day of training and one week of we're practicing it and we're good. Um, you know, in some ways people are, are practicing these kinds of skills for a lifetime. Um, and so that's where we sort of shifted how we were doing that. Um, and, and what I concluded was it's really hard to do this at scale. It's really hard to do this with 2000 students in any kind of quick way. Um, and so we have um, since been trying to figure out different ways of utilizing that core group of students to spread it out um, in other ways. Um, and so we've had shorter trainings, like one day trainings in which students come and, and practice this. Some students that we've had engaged are now doing sort of weekly discussions or monthly discussions um, that they're utilizing um, that space to begin to talk about that. We got a little messed up with COVID um, because we were launching a really big community um, event uh, in which we were gonna bring those students to actually begin to have that conversation in Durham um, with citizens, with uh, nonprofit directors, with activists, with government um, leaders. We had a date, we had the dinner set, we were ready to go. Um, and then we were told that we couldn't gather more than four people. Um, and soon then students were told, you're not even coming back to campus. So right now we're entirely a virtual campus and still trying to figure out ways to continue the work, um, but it's gotten much trickier um, and, and that we can't actually have the suppers that we intended. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ada. Um, Rachel, I'd like to go ahead and, and, uh, and pass to you. And I know that you know, COVID was also um, something that, that you had to roll with, but would love to hear some of the lessons that you've learned along the way. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, we had intended to do a, a relatively uh, intense and brief um, needs assessment really before the fall so we we have a quarter system so our fall quarter didn't begin until the end of september and we had really hoped to be well underway in terms of having our needs assessment done and kind of be in the design phase for our intervention really early in by you know beginning of october that was not to be um it turned out that we couldn't gather people at the pace that we had hoped to that um, everybody was really busy at the beginning of fall and immediately prior to the fall and so um, in fact the needs assessment extended really throughout the fall we just did not feel like we were seeing enough people to really get a good sense of the breadth of experience that there was on campus because the more offices that we met the more we started to notice that there was this kind of theme that um, was emerging which was that there was an office there is an office on campus which is supposed to deal with anti-oppression work so if a complaint is made about an oppressive in, uh, in interaction that has occurred it is supposed to be made directly to this office what we discovered was that every office that we spoke to had some sort of workaround so that that was a kind of um, effort of last resort and instead they were all doing their own thing in their own offices to try to not have to go there and one of the reasons for that was because it was seen as um, very outward facing as um, as as a, a response the that office did a very outward facing response which was sort of anti-litigious anti, -litigious, anti 
the kind of press that would damage the reputation of the university and was much less concerned about the transformation of individuals or working relations within a group. And so we had this sort of um, uh, these currents, I'll call them for now, in, in each office where which were highly siloed. And I think my, my own belief about that siloing, which we noticed after doing the interview, so haven't yet had a chance to really discuss with everybody, um, was that it, it was siloed because people didn't want to talk about it very loudly in case the office that was supposed to be dealing with these issues found out and they were confronted and actually prevented from doing those kinds of interventions. So um, while there was, there was certainly calling out that was happening and most of the people that we spoke to saw, believed that there was a place for calling out, but they intended it as a step towards a pivot, which would lead to transformation and change rather than a step towards exclusion. And what they felt was really happening in the uh, formal process by this office, which was supposed to be dealing with these situations, was that there was no opportunity, there was no due process, there was no transparency to the process, and that frequently it did lead to exclusion of certain kinds. And um, people were trying to avoid that where possible, that they wanted the chance to transform their relationships and for people to change. Um, the ways that they were dealing with um, each other. So, um, so as those sorts of themes started to emerge, we really realized we needed to slow down and the needs assessment itself was really revealing things that we needed to know about the campus before we charged in thinking that we knew what everybody needed. So, um, so the needs assessment concluded sometime in January and we, at that point, um, at that point was when we decided, okay, this is how we want to design our intervention. And um, the, the labor was divided on our team. And so the intervention was designed as a kind of convening of people and everybody who had been part of the interviews was gonna be invited to an event, which we would cater and then provide an opportunity for them to really talk with each other and break down these silos. Um, potentially with the opportunity for organizing so that the official response could perhaps be challenged. And um, unfortunately, due to illness, fortunately not COVID-19, um, the person who was to convene that um, event, which was supposed to have happened in the last week of February, um, was unwell and was not able to do so, and so we postponed it. And we postponed it right into <laughs> the progressive and rapid shutdown of our campus. And as Ada has shared, we suddenly weren't allowed to assemble more than a few people at a time and then only for urgent meetings. And then we pretty much got locked off campus and everybody's focus because we were not in the middle of a semester. We were at the end of a quarter. So we were anticipating another full quarter plus the summer session. Mm -hmm. um, there, everybody with two weeks notice had to put all of their class, their whole classes for the following quarter, either online or remote access. And I'm afraid the bandwidth at that point kind of became limited because everybody was shifting to virtual working, mm. um, anticipating a pretty lengthy um, time of that. So, um, so we have not done the intervention at this point and um, we're still, we're just now in the third week of term, so we're still sort of emerging from that initial crush of change that um, in order to continue to run our um, this quarter plus the summer quarter, which we've been told will also be virtual. So that's where we're at. Um, thank you, Rachel. And I appreciate your reflectives here on, on um, navigating not only changing schedules and availability of folks, but also uh, the ways that administration and uh, sort of the cultures of universities um, become something to navigate in this, this sort of project. Um, Ashley and, uh, and Leslie, I wonder um, how you would speak towards some of the things that you all learned along the way and you know, how vision eventually manifested itself in the project. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think one of our biggest uh, learnings, uh, our process was amazing. You know, I think for me as a non-Indigenous Australian, you know, I really had to, uh, I was on my own journey. And I think as, you know, a program designer, as a facilitator, as an educator, I have a particular way of working. I have a particular way of pulling together content and workshops, usually can whip them together pretty quickly. Um, and so what was really powerful, I think, aside from the end result, and, and we can talk about, um, you know, some of the moments in the workshops was actually the journey between and the relationship between Leslie and I. And really for me, you know, it was, it was learning to decolonize myself and my ways of knowing and my ways of being and my ways of doing. Um, and that took some time and I had to be pretty honest with myself in some moments. Um, I think Leslie had quite a chuckle at me <laughs> at a, uh, in a few moments because, you know, I, I just was so fixed on, okay, well, this is how we, how we need to do things. And look, some of that came from, you know, the expectations around a grant and working within a higher education institution and what we had to deliver and the data we needed to collect and how this had to be structured and the outcomes and what we'd promised and all of that stuff. And the reality was I had to let all of that go in the process and I had to be fluid. And so I'm sure you know, lots of smart people in the room, you know, things like co-design, really, really, really co-designing, not consulting, really co-designing was really important. Um, you know, having conversations and really listening to um, Indigenous people within our institution um, outside of the, the people working on the project. So we had conversations with um, our pro vice chancellor, Indigenous engagement, Adrian Miller. Um, and, you know, he put things out there that I think challenged me in terms of the way that we should be starting the workshop. You know, Leslie's approach um, is probably much more relaxed than mine. So, you know, Les, I don't know if you wanna talk about, you know, what is an indigenous way of starting the workshop and just some of the things around that in terms of really getting to know each other and build trust and have a yarn and have a cup of tea. Um, do you wanna jump in there, Les? Yes, I can jump in there. So um, I suppose part of the process when we are designing, like Ash touched on, it was like more structured approach and and we were trying to look at it through the Indigenous lens. So I suppose um, at the start of the process, we, we had to keep reminding ourselves that this is what we were looking at. It was sort of one of those things where we said, well, this is what we want to look at. We want to change the narrative, the paradigm to way, the way um, non-Indigenous Australia thinks, um, knows, um, and looks at our people, our first people. And to do that, um, we had to go through, I suppose, that conversation. and. That was right around that, um, I suppose, that design. So how do we do that? Um, and it was, you know, I suppose even when I was talking to Ashley um, initially about the project, she got nervous when we started talking about, you know, like these Indigenous perspectives. Um, we were going to deliver a workshop on it from that view. Um, and it makes a lot of non-Indigenous people a little bit nervous talking about, um, I suppose, those, those hidden histories, um, the histories of violence and um, frontier wars and that sort of thing. And it, and it brings those emotions to the surface straight away, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous from whatever perspective you're looking at. So we decided that the best way to, um, I suppose, deflect that was to move away from that conversation and go to a conversation about what Australia was for the last 65,000 years, how our people socially innovated, um, how we looked at the world, how we structured our social, our social, I suppose, um, our, our structures, our villages, um, our civilization, the way we taught, our education systems, um, the way we looked at the world. And you know, it's a very environmental way our people looked at the world. Um, I suppose to know the indigenous mindset is to, um, I suppose, practice some of the things that I heard earlier. It's like when our people come together, they take the time. So, and it's funny, even as a younger man, I was always like, you know, how long does it take to say hello, Uncle? You know, you know, we've been here for 15, 20 minutes already. You had two cups of tea and you're still yarning on about, you know, how's the weather going? How's Artie doing? What's going on there? But it's this whole process. And a lot of the times the uncles pull me up and just go, slow down, boy, you know, sit down, take the time, breathe the air, smell the roses. So that Indigenous mindset, and, and I heard someone speak about this earlier, how you engage with people and how you, how you move away from those, I suppose, you're going to get to that conversation, but how you... I suppose relax people into that and, and, and go at it a different way. 
Um, so that was part of the process. Um, we had lots of things. We knew we were going to have pushback from, I suppose, not only um, Indigenous, but non-Indigenous people when we started talking about this, you know, they're going, well, you know, where you get this information. Um, part of that process, I thought was really interesting with the way, and I had some, I suppose, those, those chuckle moments that Ash was talking about where, hang on, she's had a light bulb moment and then she's gone off and gone, well, hang on, I can't believe everything Les is telling me. I better go and research a bit of this. So she's gone out and found some really interesting people to research um, that are writing some great books in Australia at the moment about Indigenous culture, um, the way we work the land, the way we maintain it. Um, and then she was coming back and going, wow, it's like this guy's saying the same stuff you're doing, but he's saying it so much better, Liz. And it was like... <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> well, I know you were thinking no. it. <laughs> um, but I think that, like, you know, one thing that was really important was to really just consider our audience and knowing that there was going to be academic, you know, I suppose, staff in the room and expectations around the way we presented it. So it was, it was, I suppose, this challenge of being really authentic and presenting things in a really Indigenous way, which isn't always backed up by research and referencing and, and literature and all that sort of stuff. It's storytelling and it's passing on of knowledge in a really, um, yeah, through story, um, but also recognising the people that we had in the room. So we had to kind of jump between the two, I think. We had to bounce between two worlds quite a bit. Um, but something that was really powerful just on that, how do we... How do we begin the workshop? Leslie got uh, lemon myrtle. Um, what else do we have? We had gumby gumby. We had all of these kind of traditional teas and we just had a yarn and we had a cup of tea and that's how we kicked off our workshop, which was really powerful and really beautiful. We also had objects in the room like boomerangs and um, some hunting, um, uh, what, what are they called, Leslie? Hunting. Warmers. Warmers. Yeah, <laughs> um, so that people could touch and feel and just I know that we're probably going to run out of really time really quickly, but I just I suppose I wanted to say that, you know, when we talk about polarization, often we step into the conversation with a particular perspective, expecting other people to either understand our, our perspective or, you know, meet us there and what we really try to do instead of stepping into that space of conflict because as Leslie said often in Australia there's an uncomfortability talking about the reality of what happened talking about the like the genocide and invasion and these words that people are really uncomfortable with so rather than starting with those conversations we started with a cup of tea a yarn getting to know you and celebration and I think that was really the core of our workshop how do we celebrate Indigenous people as socially innovative. And through that came respect, came empathy, came understanding, and came curiosity to know more. Thank you. Um, I, I, have re I do realize that we have run, like this time has flown. So Emily has been looking at some of the questions that have been posed and if there are any that we wanna lift up in this moment and uh, maybe some of the panelists, if you can offer, you know, just very short um, answers and reflections on them. Thank you, Eddie. Um, yeah, we have a number of really great questions. And so um, I'd even offer if the panelists are up for it, um, maybe going a little bit over uh, because of the number of great questions um, and inviting those of you who are on the call, if you are able um, to stay on the call for a few moments after. Um, and I'd also, I'm going to share in the chat, um, as you're listening to the questions or getting ready to head off the call, We'd love to hear your thoughts on this session um, and what really stuck out to you and what other questions you still have. This is an ongoing conversation and honestly the beginning of one in, in our community here at Ashoki U um, and we see all of you as part of it. So please do share um, the questions that you have and the resources that you have as well as we start building a community who are talking about how do you address polarization in a variety of ways. And I've loved to hear how that has shown up and how each of the three panelists are really taking, asking questions about the culture of their institution in creative ways and how, um, how to break, build new cultures um, that bring folks together. And so I will start with the questions and just to be fair um, from the ones that were shared first and go through. Um, so from uh, Clara, uh, she asked, how can higher ed promote political conversation in a way that promotes learning and can help encourage voter participation for younger generations? 
and it's open to the full group. Um, it wasn't directed at anyone in particular. So invite the panelists to share. Can I have a chop at that one? Please. Go ahead, Leslie. Okay, so can you just uh, throw the question back past me again so I've got it in my head? Yeah. How can higher ed promote political conversations in a way that promotes learning and can help encourage voter participation for younger generations? I think that's the way we, um, I suppose, structure those conversations. Um, part of those, part of the um, practice we were talking about with the Indigenous mindset was, um, you see a lot of people come out with ideas or look at ways that they can change social structures to benefit society. Um, and they're generally pecked on or hammered away on by the non-believers or the or those ones that um, are a bit ignorant. Um, so we find in our society that um, if someone has an idea, you've either got to have a better one, um, you can't belittle their idea, you can't break it apart, you can't, um, I suppose, turn it into fake news as it was. So I think part of that process, part of that structure, um, part of the way we hold that conversation is important. Does anyone else want to take a stab? I will add just one bit, and I'm sure we want to move on. Um, I mean, one of the things I think we do at the Keenan Institute is actually try to model that civil discourse. And so almost any issue that we are presenting, sort of how to think about that, we almost always have people that are in opposition in what they believe and in what they think. And then having people engage together in a way that they actually learn from each other and that people come away with it. Um, thinking differently, or even maybe more affirmed in what they think, but they understand better why. That's often what our goal is. Um, and I think that actually makes a difference, is, is, is showing people this actually can be done, and it can be done in a way that's enriching to people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another one um, that asked, how can we create an open and honest dialogue around important issues while also creating a space that is safe for students who have more personal connections to the issues? And so Rachel, I don't know if you want to hop in there or anyone else. Um, we, you know, our, our, unlike the other panelists, it's been so interesting to listen to these wonderful projects. So I really appreciate being invited onto the panel. But our focus was really on um, kind of staff um, relationships on campus, not on student relationships. Nevertheless, staff have difficult conversations also, particularly when somebody in an office has experienced an oppressive interaction with somebody else in the office. Um, and so what we were hoping to discuss with people and, and did talk more with people about was restorative practices and various kinds of restorative practices that could be happening in, in offices um, to, to um, build sort of coherence and understanding and compassion within the community. Um, I took Ada's point earlier about how difficult it is to scale these things. Um, and that actually it, within individual units, there was a better chance for um, people to develop working cultures that actually were supportive and um, understood the standpoint of various different people in the space. Um, so uh, I don't know, it's not, doesn't really answer the question, but it sheds perhaps light a bit on, on how we, what we discovered in our project. I'm just going to echo, we incorporated a lot of restorative practices into our work as well. Thank you. Um, we have another um, comment and sort of invitation for your, your feedback from Marvin Lin, um, who said, I'm concerned about the increasing polarization between university colleagues who share commitments to engagement, but may be very different in terms of race, gender, and sexuality, and so on. And so I think wanted your feedback about how to, how do you approach that? when there's polarization between colleagues um, who, who share a commitment to engagement. Let me just speak a little bit to what we heard other, uh, other offices talking about, the kinds of activities that they did together in order to try to build that kind of community. So in particular, what we, what we found was that there were a number of different kind of um, they weren't informal because the expectation was that everybody would attend, but there were a number of, of 
group meetings that occurred that were not business related, that they were um, related to sort of building understanding so that, for example, um, the, the widespread use of um, pronouns and the, the actual indication of pronouns in people's signatures on, on, in people's email, for example, is a relatively new um, thing that has happened on our campus. And um, so some of, the, some of the offices have actually had meetings to discuss the importance of that because it hasn't been made, it's not a policy um, across the university. So different units are taking it up, individuals are taking it up at, in a sort of ad hoc way. So that, for example, was one thing that um, these meetings might discuss the importance of that, or they might discuss the um, importance and impact of Title IX changes or of um, Me Too or of Black Lives Matter or, of, you know, and these, these meetings had started as long ago as Occupy. We had a very large Occupy movement in Portland that affected us directly because the campus is in the center of the city. and. Um, so we had um, some um, spaces on campus and and students from campus in the Occupy space. So, so, so these meetings, sometimes they were book groups, um, reading things like Tommy Orange's um, book, um, to, to just sort of build consciousness, really. They were almost like consciousness raising um, meetings that occurred that... Um, which were open spaces. There was no, uh, as I say, there was no business being done. There were confidential spaces where people could build trust with each other so that they could call each other in instead of just having to call each other out um, related to oppressive practices. And it was interesting seeing groups of people talk about how they were, how they would just attract someone's attention to an insensitive comment or um, yeah, so that's what we saw in our groups. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, Emily, I think. Thank you. Um, one last question. Uh, this has been incredibly enriching, and I think we could probably have a two or three hour session um, on this topic. So thank you to the panelists. Um, again, a reminder, if you have a chance to fill out the survey, that would be wonderful to hear from you. Um, but this final question, I might ask each of the panelists to respond to and just um, one example. And this question is from Josh Young. Can you share um, a resource or article or activity? So if you could just share one example, um, ways to introduce to faculty, um, to introduce this topic to faculty, to help prepare them for the work with their students. Um, so I invite each panelist to share just one example you'd like to share with a group. Um, and then, yeah, and then we'll hand it over to Eddie to end the call. So maybe uh, you, the team there, Leslie or Ashley. Yeah, I was just going to say um, from a, a, a institutional perspective, something that was really beneficial um, was uh, our PVC Indigenous Engagement had developed a um, great guide to indigenizing the curriculum and really unpacking um, what we mean by Indigenous ways of knowing, Indigenous ways of being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other thing I would say, if you are inter interested in um, how Indigenous thinking might save the world or, or, or positively impact the world, um, particularly Australian Indigenous ways of knowing, being and, and doing. Um, there's a great book called Sand Talk by uh, Tyson Yunker-Porter. And I'll put that in the chat as well. And that was like really pivotal for me and, and my journey. Great. Um, Ada? Sure, I mean, I would actually um, suggest doing some, some looking into restorative practices. Um, you know, there's lots of great introductory um, books about that. Um, there's actually an Australian, Derek Brooks is my favorite, that's Beyond Harm. Um, and it, it sort of changes the framework um, for thinking about things and understanding things in terms of harm. Um, and there's also Howard Zayer's uh, Little Book of Restorative Justice. But I think a lot of those practices uh, can be adapted in context um, 
that make it uh, a really rich resource for thinking about structures for how to have these kind of conversations in classrooms, in dorms, in clubs, in social groups, um, everywhere. Thank you. And if you all want to share this in the chat, that would be wonderful too. The resources you're sharing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then finally, over to you, Rachel. Yeah, I appreciate um, Ada's pointing out restorative practices, and there is there are actually several little books um, which point toward various different kinds of restorative practices. Um, there is one on restorative practices in higher education, um, but I'm not familiar with the authors. I can probably pull it off a shelf and. I, I, if there's some way for me to email that to you, Emily, or something, but I, I'm afraid I don't have it to hand. Um, the other one is the um, Book of Restorative Justice in Education, which is um, relatively new by Evans and Vandering. And those that's a really excellent book that sort of explains the opportunity in education, unlike in criminal justice, that in education to actually build community that prevents harm um and uh so that it puts a lot of focus on those kinds of community building opportunities in addition to how we respond to harm thereafter um and i also would suggest that if you haven't read changing lenses which is howard Zare's um initial um book then that is extremely interesting and actually john braithwaite's crime shame and reintegration is a pretty important book for restorative justice too Thank you, Rachel. Leslie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, actually pretty well touched on, but there's um, plenty of great papers out there on indigenous culture. And um, I, uh, I would say to anyone, if you can get a hold of them and have a bit of a look at the way Australians innovated and the way their social structures work, go for it. Wonderful. Well, a big thank you to every single one of our panelists for their wisdom, for their projects. Uh, a big thank you to Emily who had to hop off for another call. Um, and a big thank you to each one of you for spending some extra time with us here to, uh, to delve into the questions that were offered. Um, in my project, we talk about, just as a closing reflection, we've talking, taken to using the language of remembering, um, remembering across generations, remembering that outer life is deeply tied to inner life that our bodies hold history and personal story as much as our thinking memory, and that social healing requires relationships that are capable of holding nuance and, and moral wrestling, um, and frankly, the, you know, failure even, and paradox and forgiveness. Um, so we all struggle, struggle to live what we say, and I really am grateful for this community that's actively working to practice and heal. And uh, I wish you all the very best as you go about this work in your own communities. So thank you for joining today.